some of the more unusual reasons that women have given as, uh, as the reasons that they have sex, and as reported by our next speaker, Dr. Cindy Meston, are, it gets rid of my migraines, <laughs> to relieve boredom, it's easier than fighting. <laughs> it gives me something to do. <laughs> My favorite, I feel sorry for them. <laughs> but, but I do think that it was Joan Crawford who gave perhaps the all-time best line, I have sex for a clearer complexion. So where's Dr. Cindy Meston? I've been looking forward to her talk all day, Why Women Have Sex. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It's such a great honor to be here. I began studying women's sexuality as an undergraduate at the University of British Columbia over 20 years ago. And I chose to go into the field because at the time there had been very little research conducted on the sexual physiology of women since Masters and Johnson in the 1970s. And uh, funding agencies were just not willing to fund sex research. They were willing to put money, however, into understanding reproductive function. So this told us a lot about men's sexual desire and arousal and orgasm because erection and ejaculation pertain to reproduction. But it told us nothing about women's sexual function. So as a consequence, up until just about a decade or so ago, most of what we knew about women's sexual physiology was based on analogies drawn to men. And there are certainly some similarities, but there are also some important differences. And I'm going to uh, tell you two things that I've learned about women's sexuality in the past two decades. Number one, um, <laughs> women are more complicated than men. If you put a man into a laboratory sh setting and show him a sexual film, how aroused he says he is is pretty much directly related to what his penis is doing. If you do the same thing with a woman, how aroused she says she is has really very little to do with how her genitals are responding. And I'm just going to show you quickly how we measure the sexual response in the laboratory. This is my lab. This is a participant testing room where they're seated comfortably by themselves. I'm in the room next door controlling the equipment. Across from the participant, you can see is a large flat screen TV where we present the sexual films. If we're testing a woman, we use special films that are produced by women for women. They differ from the more traditional male-produced erotica in that they have a little bit nicer lighting, they focus on the women's sexual pleasure, and they have a plot. <laughs> um, <laughs> We measure women's genital arousal using a vaginal photoplethysmograph. It has a small light source that emits a light into the vagina and measures the amount of light reflected back. So when a woman is sexually aroused, there's more blood flow in her genitals, less light is reflected back. Uh, for men, we use a penile strain gauge which is a device placed around the penis in a non-erect state, and as he becomes aroused, it puts resistance um, onto the strain gauge, and it's an indirect measure of uh, blood flow in the genitals. So getting back to then, why is it that men's psychological and genital arousal are so well connected and women's aren't? Well, this is an important question, and nobody really knows the answer, but I'll tell you um, what I think. I think if you think about it just simply from an anatomical perspective, a male's penis, when erect, is out there, waiting, wanting to be noticed. Uh, a woman's genitals, on the other hand, are quietly, uh, neatly tucked away and easy to ignore. Secondly, there's just simply more tissue in a man's penis than in a woman's vagina to become engorged with blood, so the signal's a lot stronger. And thirdly, if you think, uh, think about it from a developmental perspective, from a very early age, men are comfortable handling their penis because they use it to urinate. Women, on the other hand, are often socialized, even today, to, you know, don't look, don't touch down there like it's some sort of biohazard zone. Uh, <laughs> 
so these things together make it such that when a man has an erection, he's likely to notice it because it's a strong signal and he's likely to want to do something ab about it because he's used to attending to genital cues and comfortable doing so. Women, on the other hand, when they have increased blood flow into the genitals, and we've done this many, many times in my laboratory, you can increase the blood flow into women's genitals with Viagra or intense exercise, just like you can in men. But the difference is, oftentimes women don't notice that there's more blood in their genitals, or if they do notice it, it doesn't impact their psychological arousal. Because the signal is weaker and easier to ignore, and they're not used to attending to genital cues, they're more influenced by environmental cues, by what's going on. Did the husband remember to bring the dry cleaning home? Has the dog been fed? Has the laundry been folded? And because there's about 100,000 possible things that can be on their minds and distracting them, it necessarily makes becoming aroused and staying aroused more complicated for women. Okay, number two, women have sex for many different reasons. There's been a lot of research looking at why people have um, the type of people, I'm sorry, the type of sex people have, the frequencies that they have it, and a lot of research sends self-help books on trying to enhance sexual function. But no one had asked the very simple question of why do people have sex? Probably because they assume the answer is obvious. Well, people have sex because it feels good or they want to reproduce or because they're in love. And uh, my colleague David Buss and I figured it was a little bit more uh, complicated than that. So we began what's now become a six-year investigation of human sexual motivation with a focus on why women have sex, which is the title of our recently published book. The first study we did, we simply asked a large group of men and women to list all the reasons they could possibly think of why they had ever had sex in their lives. And we came up with 715 reasons that we condensed into what we believe are 237 <laughs> relatively distinct reasons. Uh, in a second study, we administered all of those reasons to another large group of men and women uh, and found that they clustered into a number of, dis of distinct categories that we labeled as uh, attraction, pleasure, love, commitment, experience, adventure, competition, economics and bartering, revenge, medicinal, duty, mate guarding, mate poaching, and pressure and coercion. In terms of gender differences, the most uh, interesting finding we got is that there really weren't substantial differences between men and women. Often you hear it said that men have sex for pleasure and women have sex for love. We found just as many men as women had sex because they said they wanted to feel connected to their partners. And just as many women as men had sex for the pure physical gratification. In the third study we conducted exclusively for our book, we asked over a thousand women ages 18 to 86 to tell us why they had sex for these many different reasons. And it was a pretty ethnically and geographically diverse group of women. Not surprising, the majority were heterosexual, about 7% bisexual or homosexual, and then we had a, a group of women who chose to fill in their own sexual orientation, which included the labels gay, lesbian, asexual, bi-curious, heteroflexible, omnisexual, pansexual, queer, straight plus, fluid, open, polyamorous, mostly hetero with a touch of gay, and still questioning. So uh, today I'm going to share a few quotes of, uh, from the women in our study and tell you just a few of the facts that we found interesting in our investigation of why women have sex. I'm going to start with the number one reason why women said they had sex, because they were attracted to the person. And let's talk about, I'm sorry, who do women want? 80% of personal ads by women say they want a man six feet or taller. Women even use height as a selection criteria when choosing a sperm donor. Tall, muscular men have sex at an earlier age. They have more sexual partners. They have more children. They also have more extramarital affairs. They're judged by both men and women to be more physically and socially dominant. So to a, a woman, from an evolutionary perspective, this triggers um, or signals the ability of the man to protect her and provide for her by being strong and virile enough to go out and hunt the wild boar and bring home the bacon. 
Uh, women are attracted to all sorts of masculine features, masculine voices, masculine facial features. This uh, photograph has been computer morphed on a continuum from feminine to masculine. And many, many studies have shown that women rate men at the masculine end of the continuum as being most attractive. And when, during ovulation, when a woman is most likely to become pregnant, she is most likely to rate the most masculinized man, uh, man as being most attractive. Now what's interesting is the bones in a man's face take shape during adolescence under the influence of testosterone. And high levels of testosterone compromise the immune system. So in a sense, only above average healthy men can afford to produce enough testosterone to be able to create these very masculine features. So in a sense, it's uh, signaling good health, good genes that could be passed on to the children or the offspring. Okay, uh, women rate smell as the most important of the senses when choosing a lover, more so than visual cues, which hands down is most important for men when picking a lover. Women's olfactory acuity peaks during ovulation, which has led a number of evolutionary biologists to suspect it plays a role in reproduction. I'm going to mention just a few fa of the many fascinating studies. Researchers have found that women can actually detect MHC compatibility through a sense of smell. Now, the major histocompatibility complex contains genes responsible for immune system functioning, and it's better to mate with someone who has slightly different MHC from oneself because it produces healthier children. What these researchers did is they took blood samples from a large group of men and women to determine their MHC. They then collected underarm sweat from the men for a number of days and later had the women rate the smell of the sweat on a continuum from very attractive to, you know, really disgusting. And they found that women preferred the aromas of men with a MHC complex, complementary to their own as most attractive. Other researchers have found that women can detect uh, physical symmetry through a sense of smell. Now, most people are bilaterally symmetrical, so the length of your left ear is approximately the same length of your right ear. People are all a little, differ a little bit from perfection, but in general, um, symmetry is a good thing. Uh, genetically speaking, it's an indicator of few mutations, few environmental insults. Here we have um, an example of a fairly symmetrical fellow um, not so symmetrical, but doesn't matter because he's got lots of money. Um, <laughs> uh, so what these researchers did is they determined the symmetry ratings of a large group of men, collected their sweat, had the women rate the attractiveness of the sweat, and guess what? Women rated the scent of the sweat of the men who were most symmetrical as being most attractive. So these studies showed that man, man's scent can actually kind of secretly tell women something about their reproductive fitness. Okay, not surprisingly, women were also attracted to men of high status. The personality factors that came out as being most important for women were self-confidence and a sense of humor, the latter of which the comedian Jimmy McFarland seems a little uh, skeptical of when he is quoted as saying, one of the things women claim is most important in a man is a sense of humor. In all my years as a comedian, I've, I've learned that they're usually referring to the humor of guys like Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, and Russell Crowe. Apparently, those guys are hilarious. <laughs> Okay, so what about some of the more unexpected reasons why women had sex? Like the women who said they had sex to intentionally give someone a sexually transmitted infection. Or the women who said they had sex because they wanted to get closer to God. I had been thinking about how if God is imminent, that meant Christ was in me and in everyone. If Christ was in me, then he would also be in my partner. I suddenly had this moment where I realized that if we joined ourselves, it could be Christ seeking Christ and how beautiful that would be. That one makes me feel incompetent. Uh, okay. <laughs> Women in our study reported lots of revenge sex. My ex was an asshole to me, so when we got out of a relationship, I had sex with his friend. It was fun, and I enjoyed it because I knew it would piss him off. 
Lots of competition sex where women would go together uh, to bars and groups and compete to see who could have sex with the most desirable man. They weren't looking for a, a relationship, it was all about winning. In high school, I remember feeling very proud of my number of sexual partners. I would get a thrill just before sex, thinking to myself, another one. I snared another one. Conquest. The motives we found ranged from the very mundane of having sex because they were bored and had nothing better to do, to the adventurous. Women were curious what it would be like to have sex with people of different ages, ethnicities, genders, financial endowment, and most commonly, what it would be like to have sex with men of different anatomical endowment. Women were curious to explore their sexuality, to become better lovers. They did it, had sex simply because they wanted another notch on their belt or because they wanted to get rid of their virginity so they could explore their sexuality or fit in with a peer group. Or as this young woman said, I sort of felt like I just wanted to get it over with. It was fine and now I have that out of the way. Lots of sexual economics. Women traded sex for jobs, promotions, raises, money, drugs, Gucci belts, gifts, dinners, weekends away with friends and household chores. One woman in our study who had a much lower sex drive than her husband said she agreed to have sex with him on a weekly basis as long as he agreed to mow the lawn and take the garbage out on a weekly basis. Equally aversive tasks in her eyes. Lots of duty sex, and not just among older women. I think this is the best definition of duty sex by Lady Alice Hillington in the late 1800s. I am happy now that Charles calls on my bedchamber less frequently than of old. As it is, I now endure but two calls a week, and when I hear his steps outside my door, I lie down on my bed, close my eyes, open my legs, and think of England. <laughs> Duty sex most commonly occurs, of course, when there's mismatches in sex drive, but for a lot of women, it's messages passed down from their parents or grandparents that it's the wifely duty to have sex with their man. For some women, it's embedded in religious doctrine. For others, it's just the easiest way to keep the guy quiet. Sometimes it was easier to just give in and do it when he wanted to rather than put up with listening to him whine and complain about how horny he was. Some women reported feeling angry and resentful at having had duty sex, and for others it was no big deal. In fact, it was an effective strategy for keeping the peace. I love my husband, but when you've been married for a while, let's face it, sex just isn't that exciting anymore. It's all so predictable. I have sex because I feel I owe it to him as his wife. The truth is, though, most of the time I just lie there and make lists in my head. I grunt once in a while so I, he knows I'm awake, and then I tell him how great it was when it's over. It seems to be working. We're happily married. <laughs> Women had sex as a mate-guarding tactic. My mother taught me to please my man or someone else well. The notion here is to have lots of sex with your guy to satiate him so that he doesn't stray. Doesn't really work all that well, partly because there's a lot of mate poachers out there. Mate poaching occurs because oftentimes the, the uh, very desirable mates have already been taken, so women develop a strategy alluring away already taken mates. Women had sex for many health benefits, for pain relief, to decrease stress or anxiety as a sleep aid, to alleviate depression or loneliness, lose weight, keep warm, keep healthy, relieve menstrual cramps, and get rid of a headache. So by now you might be thinking, what about love? This young woman wrote, for my 20th birthday, my boyfriend took me out to an amazing seafood restaurant and we had a really incredible time. He treated me like a princess. I felt so loved and I was so in love and all the feelings from the romantic atmosphere of the restaurant carried over to his grungy apartment and we made love on his bed. It was the best sex we've ever had. So yes, still there are times when love can conquer all, in this case, the site of a dirty dorm room. And love indeed was one of the 16 major categories of sexual motivation motivation we found for women, but you might want to keep in mind that when women say they're having sex for love, it's not just because they're in love, but it's often because they're trying to get love, steal love, protect love, or get over love. As one woman in our study said, the best way to get over a man is to get under another one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, you just
touched on it lightly as you were listing all the different reasons, but, but I've read that, in fact, a, a very high-level reason that women like certain men is that they are liked by other women. That, yes. in fact, it's yes. a high priority. Yep. What women like about certain men is that they're fancied by other women. Yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, in species ranging from fish to mammals, females use the mate choices of other females to pick their man. So it's like they're looking for pre-approved females. Let the other women do the work and uh, screen them out. And if they like them, he must be a good one. So they want to steal them away. Right. <laughs> and yet, uh, women make a big deal about men cheating, right? I mean, I've always hated that term, but... Right. It works both ways. There are mate, male mate poachers and female mate poachers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to find the logic in it. And the other thing that struck me about your remarks is that I thought that a good number of those reasons might apply equally to men yes, as Yes, well they do. Women. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with different frequencies, the lists are slightly different, but most of the reasons applied across genders. As I said, there were more gender similarities than differences. And uh, in terms of the discussion that we've had through the day, this beginning of a transference of power from males to females, are you finding any trajectory of change in the reasons why women have sex? Um, well, th that's a good question. We haven't looked at, diff we've looked at um, age differences up to post-menopausal women, but not beyond. And we actually haven't found significant differences between age groups up to age 50. But beyond that, we have not looked and we might expect there to be because of different rearing. Um, we haven't looked at ethnic and religious differences, which of course are gonna play a profound role in the decisions why women have sex. Well, fascinating. You're gonna continue with your research? Yes, yes. Well then, we'll yeah. have to have you back. <laughs> <Part two. laughs> and by the way, I love the dress. Thank you. Really <laughs> Thank Thanks you. Very much, Dr.